Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, roundtable with directors of the cath labs around the country and the world. Uh, this is Roxana Moran from Mount Sinai Hospital, and this is a program for Women as One, uh, a not-for-profit organization promoting talent in medicine and making sure that women have the equal playing ground in medicine altogether. And I'm so, so pleased today where we're focusing on, a, on an area in a very, very broken house of interventional cardiology where the number of women is dwindling and it's extremely small, but we have an, a wonderful diverse round table with some of the leaders in the country and around the world who are cath lab directors. And I wanna welcome each and every one of you and thank you for the time you're giving us for this round table. So we start with our guests here and I wanna introduce each and every one of them. We start with Dr. Fred Welt. He is the Associate Chief of Cardio uh, Cardiovascular Medicine, Director of the Cardiac Cath Lab at University of Utah in Salt Lake City, Utah. Welcome, Dr. Welt. He's also currently the Chair of the Interventional Council of the American College of Cardiology. I was very, very lucky to work with him and I know the kind of incredible, inclusive and brilliant man that he is. And he will help many women climb the difficult lab ladder in interventional cardiology. We then have Jamie McCabe, an incredible, uh, complex, fantastic operator. I love working with Jamie and, and he's just a fabulous, fabulous interventionalist. He's the director of the cardiac cath lab in one of the busiest uh, hospitals in Seattle, Washington, University of Washington Medical Center. Welcome, uh, Jamie. We're just so, so proud to have you here on this round table. We then, we also have David Lee, who is uh, another brilliant interventionalist, a, a friend, colleague, director of the cardiac cath lab and interventional cardiology and in the laboratories at Stanford University at Stanford uh, in uh, Palo Alto, California. And then we have with us Elizabeth Vondor Lowe, founder and the medical director of Women's Heart Program, director of interventional cardiology program, as well as the interventional fellowship program at Indiana University in Indianapolis. Welcome, Elizabeth. We're so, so thrilled to have you and love your beautiful, lovely paintings that's giving us a fantastic view today during our conversation. Uh, we then have also Sarah Golano, who is the medical director of the VA Ann Arbor Cardiac Cath Lab, Associate Vi Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Wellbeing at University of Michigan Medical School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Welcome, Sarah. We love that you are here. I'm calling everybody by their first name, so we don't make a mistake to call women by their first name and the boys with their last name as doctors. So we're all gonna go very, very uh, fun. Shrilla Banerjee, uh, Dr. Shrilla Banerjee is the consultant cardiologist at Surrey Sussex NHS Trust uh, from Surrey, United Kingdom. Shrilla, welcome and we uh, can't wait to, to talk with you. My dear friend and colleague, Dr. Annapurna Kinney um, is the director of the Cardiac Cath Lab director of the Structural Heart Program and the Interventional Fellowship Program, probably the busiest um, intervention, one of the busiest interventional cardiologists overall in the United States, performs over a thousand procedures per year, and by far is the uh, highest uh, volume operator, um, highest volume operator in, in the, uh, as a female operator, probably in the world, don't know that, but I know in the United States she is. Welcome, Dr. Kinney, to the program. Uh, and then we have Daniel Burakol, who is the Chief of Interventional Cardiology and Hemodynamic uh, Services at Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, a hospital where Liliana Grinfeld started it all and was really, really wearing the flag of all women around the world there, one of the first women interventionalists in the world. Uh, coming from that particular hospital in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Welcome, all of you. It took me like uh, all of like seven minutes to introduce all of you with your fantastic, uh, fanta how are you all doing? Welcome. Thank you for inviting Thank us. You. All right. Well, this is, a, this is a difficult roundtable. And of course, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of 
uh, similar interests, but we feel very strongly that one of the biggest broken houses in interventional cardiology unfortunately happens to be our subspecialty, uh, interventional cardiology in all of medicine. We have the fewest number of women uh, in training, fewest number of women who stay in practice and dwindle off and leave the practice of interventional cardiology. So maybe I'm going to start with you, Daniel. How are you, how are you making sure that you are recruiting women into the cath lab? How do you find the talent uh, for interventional cardiology in your cath lab? Well, let me tell you, Roxana, that uh, uh, searching for our experience in the, in the 30 years we have here in the hospital, we found that only three women were trained here in our, in our uh, service. So uh, the first answer should be not very well because uh, it's an extremely low number of uh, women uh, passing uh, through our, uh, I mean, uh, participating in our service. Of course, we have the history of having Liliana as the first uh, leader of this uh, group and this hospital. And uh, let me tell you, a pioneer in PCI in Argentina since in the early 80s, she performed the first PCI in Argentina. So we have a, a huge uh, uh, example, a huge uh, model in Liliana. But, uh, well, let me tell you, we cannot do... Um, a pushing program if uh, we don't have um, so the pool of applicants are low and that's a very very big problem but i'll tell yeah. you liliana grenfeld was one of the was the first woman who performed pci in argentina and she always was always very very passionate to make sure more women go into the field but she always told me in many many occasions that the 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 place was difficult. It's difficult for women. So David Lee at Stanford, one of the, the top medical schools in the country, what are you doing to, to not only uh, bring the women in, how attractive are you making your program to actually get women in? And why do you think that less women are going into interventional cardiology? Yeah, those are, those are great questions, Roxana. I think first thing I would say is that the talent is there. I see it uh, coming through the cath lab with our fellows. Um, the, the women are just as talented, if not more than the men. So I don't think it's an issue about talent. Um, it's an issue about, uh, as you're alluding to, how do we sell ourselves in the cath lab to make it a more attractive place to women? And there's a number of barriers there, I think, that we need to think about. Um, one is that the perception is that the hours are terrible. Uh, you're always on call. Um, that interferes with, uh, you know, your family life, your private life, those kinds of things, um, where I think your, your traditional thoughts about what your role is um, in society or in your family uh, can be probably more detrimentally affected by the hours that interventional cardiologists keep. The other things that, uh, and I've sat down with some of our trainees about this, um, but one of the other barriers that we don't always think about is that our cath lab staff uh, sometimes don't realize that they can also be part of um, a good thing or potentially a bad thing in terms of working closely with our women trainees <laughs> and uh, interventional cardiologists. So I think that that is another piece of this that actually surprised me when I was speaking with uh, our trainees was that sometimes they were experiencing differences in how they were treated versus the men in the, in the program. So there are some things like that that I think uh, when we think about how to uh, make the place, uh, make the cath lab, make interventional cardiology more attractive, that we often don't think about these uh, items that, that can be barriers. And we have tried at Stanford, uh, as you know, we've trained several excellent uh, women cardiologists. I think um, the final thing I would say is that as they come through the academic ranks, um, we need to make sure as program directors um, and colleagues to make sure that they get the support that they need to move from the 
instructor, assistant, associate, and finally professor level, because I don't think we have enough professors like you, Roxana, um, who are really at the top of the game. We, we need those role models there for them, but I think as men, we, sh we can do a better job too to make sure that we are doing um, the promotion that, that we need to do. No, no, it's, uh, these are really wonderful. And thank you for all of those great comments, because if we could just hit all of those things you just said, we can do a much, much better job. Jamie, how many women have you trained, and how yeah. many how many um, well, are you we, doing to help them? We might be in the minority um, here, but uh, actually, the majority of our trainee or trainees last couple of years and for the next couple of years are women. Um, so this year we grad this year seventy five percent of our interventional class was female. Next year. Uh, excuse me, this year was 66%. Next year, it'll be 75%. The year after that, uh, um, at least for the first year, 50% women. So we have um, a smaller class. We don't have 11 fellows. We have four, um, but it's, uh, it's two out of three this year, three out of four next year, two out of four the year after that are, are women. So we've so where are you been finding, doing okay. Where are you finding these repeat. amazing women? What are you doing? That's oh, they're, really good. they're everywhere. You just, I, I don't, where, I don't know. We, we've hired a couple of um, great women faculty who I think are really impressive role models and are very engaging um, people. So uh, Kate Carney is a junior faculty with us that we trained and then kept on board. And she's a really dynamic uh, and awesome person. And I think it's nice to have that sort of young, engaging role model. We just hired another a woman faculty um, that's coming on board in a couple of months. And I think it's just, it's a bit self-perpetuating. Let's go to Fred Weld. Fred, what about, uh, what about you? What are you guys doing in Utah? Well, so um, we, we actually have uh, uh, two women on faculty, uh, Anu Abraham and uh, just hired Tara Jones. Uh, Tara Jones is amazingly talented, a young woman who actually came from Jamie McCabe's uh, fellowship, uh, University of Washington. So we're, we're benefiting from that. Roxanne, I, you know, this is sort of a, a little bit of a chicken and an egg issue. I think uh, what you and others have written about is that what really helps is to see uh, role models. Uh, so as young women come through their training, if they can see people in the cath lab who are thriving and are women, it, it is sort of self-perpetuating. Um, and so I, it, and it, there are a few things I think are important. One is that you know, we know that 50% of women coming out of medical, of, of graduates uh, from medical school are women. In some ways, that, that's obviously not the problem, but we are having trouble then encouraging them to come into cardiology. And, and for me, I think of that as a sort of an existential problem. If we have, uh, you know, access to only a small, you know, pool of talent, that's terrible for us. So, you know, how do you fix this? Well, you, you show women that they can have successful, thriving, you know, careers. So I think a lot of it is making women successful once they get to the cath lab. So, so that's, let me, let me push you on that because that's the big one. How do you make them successful? Are you letting them, because what I'm seeing now in the cath labs and, and it really comes back to the rest of you all, um, Shrilla and uh, I want to hear obviously from Sarah and Elizabeth as well. And if, Anu Kinney can, can pitch in. Dr. Kinney, are you, can you hear us now? Can you try to talk to us? Yeah, I oh. think I heard your uh, question earlier, essentially saying, uh, you know, how many fellow uh, women we train. So every year between one to three, you know, uh, since uh, I'm part, integral part of the interview, always we will make some special uh, concession, make sure we will have uh, about seven to eight uh, women will interview and we have anywhere between one to three women at a time uh, in the fellowship program to go through the training. But so I, I mean, I've heard all uh, everybody's comments. A um, lot of, I mean, we have a large cardiology program uh, where uh, Sinai as well as sister hospital, there are women and uh, many of them, when they're rotating in the cath lab during cardiology fellowship, they allow to do procedures. But um, I think, um, since because of the uh, the way they feel is the hours that they have to spend in the cath lab were led and they are at the same uh, time as uh, you know uh, to have a family 
then they back off saying that they don't want to do interventional cardiology they would rather go a different route which is uh, you know non invasive or uh, do more more of uh, you know seeing patients that kind of a route they want to take but what i have been seeing is many women do interventional cardiology but a lot of them are going into structural heart uh, since structural heart uh, the time the number of hours you work is not as crazy as interventional cardiology you don't have to be i mean you cannot not have to do calls but uh, you may want to you know do two three structural heart cases and maybe two three times a week then you see clinic patient planning this patient uh, procedure so i see many women like to do structural heart which is also we can say part of interventional cardiology and now those are those are really interesting uh, thoughts first of all do you ever do do you or anyone in your program or when the when these women are coming for interviews are you trying to figure out if they're going to get pregnant in the next year because they're coming to your lab because that's happening, you know, that happens a lot. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to ask you, but I also want to know, what are you doing to make sure that uh, the, the program has some kind of a plan for family leave? Uh, are, you, are you putting together maternity uh, packages? And if someone does become pregnant, are they frowned upon? Have you seen any of those things? And what are you doing to address those issues? Thanks for those questions. Um, slightly challenging, but uh, I'll try and answer as honestly as possible. Now, um, when I was training, um, I was told very clearly that if I wanted to do interventional cardiology, I was not to get pregnant, uh, either as a trainee or as a um, consultant or attending, I think it's, it's the equivalent in the US. Um, obviously, as soon as I became an attending, I, I decided to carry on with my family and, and got on with life as I wanted to. Um, but when I see these sort of attitudes, which are still around to some degree, but not so much anymore, we try and challenge them as much as possible. Now, the problem in the, in the UK is probably on a par with the US, where only 4.8% of our ICs are women out of over 780 nationally. Um, so uh, our president of our interventional society, Nick Curzon, who I believe you know, um, uh, has set up a focus group, which I'm chairing with one of my colleagues, Cara Hendry. And we're addressing the issues of all of the reasons that have basically been discussed. Um, attitudes in the cath lab, uh, work-life balance, role models, and ongoing support when you become a consultant as well, because it's not just um, when you're training, uh, but it's also when you're uh, a, a consultant or attending that you need the support. Um, one of the things I really want to say was uh, with the role models uh, statement that um, I think Fred made, um, I really think that's absolutely true. You can't be what you can't see. So if you don't see uh, interventional cardiologists as females, as relatively normal people, as not overly aggressive people, and that people that have family and um, good working relationships, you won't you know, um, thrive to become the same sort of person or even believe that that's a possibility. So one of my suggestions, which I think is still very much a suggestion, is whether we can um, compensate people for pregnancy or time lost in pregnancy. So one of the comments I had um, from one of my trainees was that um, they, want, they felt compelled to continue in the cath lab during pregnancy, even though they had back problems and were there were there was some concerns about radiation exposure. And what I'm thinking is whether, it, you know, internationally or at least nationally, we may be able to come up with some solution that uh, if people are um, feeling they shouldn't be in the cath lab during, during the time they're pregnant or feel they can't be um, during pregnancy, whether they can have some protected time when they come back from maternity leave to actually have some protected training during that time um, without the co concerns about radiation and perhaps the, you know, the, the, lead, expo the lead weighting and whatever. So there's a, there are a number of issues really we should be thinking about how to make this it, it's all very um interesting talking about it because everyone has their own experiences but actually we need to find some practical solutions as well for for the trainees and for um the uh, ics who are female as well yeah so you know one of the things and the reason why we're having this cath lab uh, directors round table is that we can all come up with great ideas but i think it's the director of cath labs who make the rules in their cath lab it's your reign and you get to choose what you want and what kind of an environment you're creating. And, uh, and I think that it is so very important that not only are we uh, open to these important family issues, but also picking up on the talents that these women bring to the table 
and then promoting that and making sure that we could put it into play. So when you recognize that a woman is just has this great eye and is able to do these long CTO procedures or a TAVR procedure or a CLIP procedure, that you would say, you know, you should get special training in this. I want you to climb that ladder. We have a climb program that we are going to do and we can't do it unless you all participate and say, we will choose those women who are talented and should have extra training or extra attention in these different areas that would then separate them from the pack. Because we all know that women have to do work every day. Dr. Kinney and I talk and we say, we meet every day, every day. For anybody who wants to say anything on Twitter, we are very close friends and we meet every day and we talk every day and we say, she, she, t- she reminds me, remember Roxana, we have to work twice as hard. Remember that. Don't forget that. And so let's keep working. And that's what we do. We, we, we talk about that all the time. So because of that, it would be nice to just pave the road a little bit. So Elizabeth, as a co-founder of a Women's Heart Center, uh, understanding how difficult it is for women to want to do these highly specialized training with, in the most beautiful time of their lives, their youth. How are you um, making life better in the cath lab in, at Indiana University? And what are you doing to solve some of these big issues? Can you imagine that Shrilla was told, if you want to get, if you want to be an a interventional cardiologist, you shouldn't even plan to get pregnant or even think about it. And when, my, when I went for my first interview 22 years ago, or more than that, or 25 years ago, whatever it was, when I went for my interview, uh, the, the gentleman who was interviewing me leaned over, looked at my belly and said, you're not pregnant, are you? Because otherwise we can't hire you. So it was that kind of really despicable uh, treatment of women that has driven many women out of cath labs. So Elizabeth, what are you doing to help? And just as a background, this happened to me as well. Uh, I was also told that I could not get pregnant Uh, I'm from Germany, and I may have been the first woman in Germany doing CAS because I started this in 1984. Um, I wasn't born. I don't know about the rest of us here. (laughs) And uh, and when I came over here to the U.S. and wanted to do my first intervention, I was told, um, shall we ask Dr. So-and-so to help you with this? And I said, no, I think I can do that. Um, But this is history. Um, The good thing at Anyana University is we have a lot of female cardiology fellows. But unfortunately, even if some of them are very talented, most of them don't want to go into intervention for the lifestyle and sometimes radiation, but mostly lifestyle, going in at night, being available, Um, We have trained two women so far, and this year uh, one of the women applied and she most likely will be in the interventional fellowship next year. The women are treated very well in the CAS lab, so we don't see any gender differences in treatment of women. And even the nurses in the CAS lab tell me, can we hire this woman? She is great. She is wonderful. Um, And I hope it will happen. But I think it's mostly the women themselves that they don't want to go into interventional cardiology. Mm -hmm. Sarah, how about uh, at U Michigan? Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate that we've had a number of women interested in interventional cardiology. Our current, or almost current, um, interventional class will be three or two women out of three um, with some interest uh, in one of the fellows in the subsequent year. Um, But I think a lot of it has to do with just culture in general and the acknowledgement that we are actually humans and not machines. And I think just respect for the fact that as individuals, there's more to us than just what's going on in the cath lab. And I think that if we can acknowledge that, that everyone's going to have some aspect of their life that's going to um, potentially conflict with our life as an interventional cardiologist and just accepting that as the norm, whether it's having a child or you know, having a sick elderly parent, it just needs to be baked into how we view ourselves as both humans and cardiologists. And I think 
you know, we, we talked a little bit about um, making sure that, you know, these fellows that are interested, you know, pursue complicated careers and, you know, structural um, work or CTOs. I think kind of parallel to that, it's not just the work in the lab, but it's making sure that they have visibility on academic, you know, academic works, on panels, um, you know, trying to avoid inviting the same people that we're comfortable in working with, um, but looking for some fresh faces on these papers and panels to really elevate that, um, sort of the more junior members of our community um, to have some prominence and, and get to where you are, Ro Roxana, you know. Um, so I think it, ha it, it, has to, it has to be both a cultural approach, but then really thinking of the nuts and bolts operationally of, of how we um, promote the careers of, of women. Jamie, I want to hear you. Do you think that there are inequalities in your cap lab now as far as pay gaps, as well as uh, how women are treated in general? Do you, get, do you get incensed when someone treats your female colleague poorly and are you watching it and seeing it and what are you doing about it? Well, uh, you know, the, on the pay gap side of things, it is a state university. Um, salaries are fairly transparent and they're also fairly um, regimented based on time and practice and so forth. So, you know, there are, our, our women faculty are junior um, faculty currently, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't think, at least within our small interventional group, that there's huge differences there at this moment. Um, and um, I would say that, um, you know, certainly there is a, a feeling of protectionism for amongst our, our group uh, at, at large. Um, not that anyone is a knight in shining armor going to protect the vulnerable female faculty, but just that we take care of each other. And, um, and so sure, if people get treated poorly, um, they get uh, there, we have, there's some reckoning to that. That's great to know. What about in Argentina, Dr. Barakal? Are you, uh, Daniel, are you seeing, uh, are you seeing uh, inequality still? Because I'm hearing that- uh, Yeah, for sure. I, I can I, tell you we see inequality still in the United States. We're trying to work very, very hard. We're all saying we're all doing a great job, but believe you me, it's not, the pay gap still is there, the data is there to show it as well as how women are treated uh, in, in, especially in highly specialized procedures where it's not believed that women could do a successful job. But you know what? I'll have my intervention done by Dr. Kinney anytime. If I need an intervention, the only, I've already told her that she's the only one. She's going to have to come in for me if anything ever happens. But tell me, tell me about, uh, about what's going on in Argentina and what are you doing to combat that? Well, let me tell you, there is a very, very uh, deep problem in, in, in culture in our country about this issue. Uh, my and myself, I think that uh, we need to change our minds, all of us. And uh, we have to do that with uh, sometimes with, with small details and big, big issues. For example, for me, it's hard to sometimes to to uh, push our our females working in our group because it's not only uh, doctors but also nurses and technicians when they have the kid disease i told her listen you have to share the care of your children with your with your husband it's not you who have to stay at home you both have to take half and half the the need of the kid of the parents being at home so, but it's not easy, but because sometimes uh, the woman, it's herself, they don't want to do that. But, uh, well, I'm trying to give this a small and uh, uh, this a small help in this change of the culture with these kind of details. And I was hearing about uh, uh, pushing for, for uh, training programs. We are widely open to receive uh, women. And we have Carla Gatiello, you know Carla Gatiello, Roxana, perfectly. And she's in charge of Tavar. And we are pushing her to move to uh, to uh, Mitral and to Caspi the program. She was uh, visiting the USA for this training. But uh, we think that perhaps it's uh, women who have to to uh, contribute to this change. 
their cells because some hair cells because sometimes we are widely open to receive them but we don't have uh, we don't have uh, people uh, women who want to come here for training so i think it's uh, it's, great. A, uh, it's nice to hear and it's good that you are admitting that there are still in inequalities and inequities that have to be addressed and that we all as a society need to have some change in the way we view women in these highly specialized subspecialties. But uh, really I think important. That, I think that the women must to leader this, this process. Yeah, because, but, uh, but we, we, do... we need you guys to help us, you know, because it's sure. men who are sitting at the thrones at the moment, whether but you we like have it to or be... not. We've got a lot but... of women on the thrones up here. But the truth is that they're doing a lot for their programs, but that's only a drop in the bucket, in a very, very, very small bucket. Because to be very honest, we need we need a lot more, a lot more forces to make this better. And we need you men to do that. So one of the things that women as one and want why I've asked for you to, guys to get online here. Women as one is developing a climb program. This is a program for women. To, 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 to we, what we want is to work with cath lab directors, which are mostly men, to identify talented women within their uh, laboratories and become a CLIMB lab. A CLIMB lab is a lab that promotes women, identifies their talent, and allows them to be highly specialized, trained, et cetera, in a specific area and sees their career through. So... We want you all to participate in that, and that's why we've chosen you as the first group of, the, of this group to come in and to actually identify these talented women because we know you have women in your program. So David Lee, what do you think? You want Stanford as a CLIMB lab? Uh, absolutely. I think um, maybe we've been functioning as sort of an unofficial CLIMB lab already. <laughs> but I well, do think tell me that's about a, what you're doing. Yeah. What, yeah, what, think, what are you doing to help women climb then? Tell me. Yeah, so as, as I alluded to before, I think, um, you know, it, it's really a number of different steps that we need to do. And um, we've been trying to do that here. And the talent is there, as I already said before. Our fellows are terrific. Uh, my current first year fellow, she should jump right into interventional, um, but she wants to do something else. And that's, that's always heart, heartbreak to me. Right. Yeah. Um, but I do think that we have been trying uh, across the faculty to promote women, um, not only at the trainee level, but uh, again, once they um, establish themselves, we want to make sure that they have those uh, the time uh, and the protected time, actually, as uh, Shrilla was was talking about, to do the things that they need to do to advance their career. And um, uh, I think Jamie also had talked about uh, you know, and in a in a small, generally small groups of interventional cardiologists at a single center, we will cover each other, and um, it's all about teamwork. And I think that again, for our for our junior faculty, we want to make sure that they have um, the time and the tools to succeed as they move up the uh, professorial ranks. Yeah, no. Now, yeah, and no, then within the, absolutely, and within the lab itself, again, trying to promote. Um, you know, that it really is a fun place to work. I think that's one thing. And it should not be someplace where you feel very uncomfortable coming in, whether you're a man or a woman, but, I, but it is generally uh, more men dominated. Um, but I think that has changed over the years. And I think that is for the better. Um, I think the women hopefully will find it a more um, uh, accommodating place that they can do their work. Um, and, and I do think there still are some barriers there that we need to work on uh, internally, but I do think that we've been working hard on that as well to make sure there isn't some un unknown or unknown bias or microaggressions or things like that that sometimes can't come out, uh, you know, in the field of battle. And um, I, I am very much aware of these things that can happen. We actually have a, 
a system where we actually track um, potential issues like that. I have an open door policy with both the staff and the faculty, as well as the trainees, that if they encounter anything um, that they think is detrimental, I will investigate that. And it's done privately. They can send things to me anonymously, and I will investigate what's happened. Well, that's so that's wonderful, David. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you that the numbers haven't changed. I wish that <laughs> I wish that you were right about the numbers changing, but they really haven't. I mean, they're pretty bad. The last decade, it's been completely flat. And uh, it's pretty bad uh, and difficult. Uh, but but I think um, a program like CLIMB could at least, we're trying to say, but we, it, it would never work if we don't have the backing. If the, if the fellow in training or the junior faculty in your lab who's a woman doesn't have the backing of their director that says, you know what? I want you to go away for three months, let's just say, and go and learn how to do a mitral clip the way it's supposed to be done. And then come back here with that extra training and then you'll be my, our mitral clip person or, or whatever it is, something really subspecialized. Shrilla or uh, 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 you know, any of you, Shrilla, what do you think about that program? Elizabeth, you too, if you could pitch in. But Shrilla first and then Elizabeth. I think it's a great idea and I would support this. Um, I think my problem is, our problem is that not enough women are really interested in the program. And but what are you I doing to make it more interesting? I mean, it looks like David and Jamie are doing a good job getting women. Why? They should want to come to your program. What are you doing in there, Elizabeth? Why are uh, they not coming to your program? They come to our general cardiology program, but then they want to go into imaging and, uh -huh. uh, and not into intervention. And they say it's a lifestyle, um, being on call that often, getting up at night, going in Can you in make the night. lifestyle better? Can you do something to improve um, the lifestyle for both men and women in the lab? You know, more, that, more men want to go to soccer games and more yeah. men... We need a lot of men taking care of uh, our children so that we could do better things. Men and women have to work equally. So I agree. we need to make I the agree. program also nice for men. Yeah, but for the imaging people, they don't have to go in at night. Huh? They have the APP taking care of things, but we as interventionalists, we have to go in at night. Uh, yeah. I think that's the issue. Yeah. Srila and then Dr. Yeah. Kinney. I think... Um, the, the thing about uh, equal shared care of um, children, that Daniel, the point that Daniel made was absolutely valid. And we are learning a lot in this post or intra-COVID era that we're in at the moment. Um, within our hospitals, we're working a lot more off-site now because when we're not having to be in to do, you know, when we can do admin off-site, we do it at home now rather than going in, which actually facilitates a much better work-life balance generally because I can shout at my children in the middle of the day rather than just waiting to the end of the, end of the, end of the day to shout at them. <laughs> um, so it means that we can do a bit more shared care. Now, the other thing that's happening in the UK is that um, we have, we had a, we've had a program for many years of less than full-time training, which allows training in all the different medical specialties, but without having to do 100% full-time working. And that for a long time was discouraged in cardiology, especially interventional cardiology. But there's been a sudden turnaround um, with our, I think generally the mood of the world has changed being more favorable towards women generally. And I think um, the, the mood has changed and it's being encouraged a lot more. So I think you can train in interventional cardiology. I don't think you can train in it working 20% of your normal full-time working week, but I think you could do four days a week and perhaps 80% of the on-call. And I think that can continue on when you're in attending as well. I think there's, as I think David made the point and Fred made the point that actually there's, there's flexibility in everybody's on-call rotors. And um, if you can just negotiate that and try and keep your balance so that it's still an encouraging and a fulfilling job without being too exhausting, then I think that's definitely to be encouraged. I think, um, Elizabeth, your point about women not wanting to do uh, interventional training, um, I would disagree with that. Actually, I think I think women get very discouraged by firstly not seeing many other women in those roles, and then also thinking that you know work life balance is compromised, and that actually um, when they become attendings, they don't actually get the support in day to day sort of microaggressions and other things that were mentioned. And so I think we do need to have these sort of pull up programs where women as one, the climb program, will actually encourage further development and ongoing. Um, personal development of, of women when they become uh, you know, more senior? It's just my personal experience because I really try to attract women 
And I think the atmosphere in our cath lab is great and I'm valued as much as my male colleagues. And uh, again, even the staff frequently wants a woman, but when I approach the younger uh, fellows, first year fellows, second year fellows, they say it's a lifestyle. They don't want yeah. to have that lifestyle. It's interesting. Uh, I think we're seeing a big, uh, we're seeing a change in that. And what we want to do is to con continue to, to build on the momentum of attracting more women and then keeping them there. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, what do you think is the best way to keep a woman engaged and, and successful in interventional cardiology? If you could look back in your career and say, what, 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 what are the key things I wish I had? I would have been so much further ahead than where I am today. Well, I can name a many, but you go ahead and tell us. I mean, I think it's, I think it's not only, um, you know, exposure to the cath lab and the procedural aspects of the field, but also those other things that we need as an academic um, cardiologist, um, whether it's exposure to clinical trial study design or, um, you know, being parts of um, academic projects kind of early on. I think that, to me, would, would be something that I would like to be able to show to our trainees, kind of a blend of what this career looks like. It's not just about the procedures, those obviously those are important, but like the whole package of what a career um, in interventional cardiology, specifically academics, um, kind of looks like. But to me, that's, that's I think, another, um, you know, component that we can focus on. But really, it's, it's also just our time and effort and dedication to our trainees, which is so complicated with us being pulled into a thousand directions you know, the financial stresses of the pandemic are going to make this coming year even more um, complicated, I think. Um, but um, to your point earlier, like, it can't just be the women. It has to be our allies and of men in the, in the cath lab. So we all just invest the time and energy into our fellows um, and do them justice. You know, they put a lot of effort in for us, you know, doing some of the scut work that none of us want to do anymore. So I think, um, you know, us really paying them back and, and really pushing them forward is, is the key. That's great. Uh, Fred, what, um, what are you seeing in, in, in uh, Salt Lake, in, in Utah, as far as e equality? And are you seeing that a light at the end of the tunnel? And in what way are you committed from the council's perspective to keep that light shining very, very bright? so that more women are not only on your council, but then chairs of the council, uh, promoted uh, through the ACC channel and other channels that you might have. What are you gonna do to make some, I want all of you, I'm gonna go around and you each will give me an answer to this question of what you personally will do to promote and to bring women in interventional cardiology and to keep their career alive and well and shining bright. Fred, you go first. Okay. Yeah, so I'll try and, and make this as brief as possible. Uh, first of all, you know, thanks for inviting me here because, um, you know, one of the issues as, as, as a white male, it's hard not to feel like part of the problem. And I want to talk about these things. Um, and it can't be just the women who carry this, but to be invited into the conversation it's an entree, which I think uh, a lot of us really appreciate. So I think that's great. I think that, um, you know, here in Utah, um, in terms of, uh, of you know, the female representation, we're, we're doing okay. And I, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I think that, um, you know, as been said by Dr. Lee and others, there's plenty of talent um, and we're seeing the fruits of that. We just need to act locally to make sure that the women who are in this, these positions uh, you know, remain successful. And that'll, I think, you know, help sort of breed uh, more success. In terms of the council, uh, we, have, uh, we have, I think, a record number of women on the council this year, and this was not affirmative action. There's lots of unbelievably talented people out there, Anna Bortnick, Shay Hogan, Mervat uh, Alansag. There's, there, there's so many people out there, you just need to look a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, I would, um, I would encourage you to help me, uh, you know, in terms of the council about things that we can do to work with, you know, the women's council, et cetera. Um, but, um, you know, we've had some ideas about, you know, uh, doing some things as simple as trying to do some interviews with young women coming in and talking about what their barriers are 
and trying to make those sort of more known to the general community. Oh, that's great. I, I would say that the, for ACC to help, and I now I'm on the board of trustees, and I can tell you that diversity and inclusion is a, is a very, very important strategic plan for the college. And we are committed to that, and we'll, I will fight for that. And I know that my colleagues, Athena Pappas, as the president, will, will make sure that that happens and that we will create an environment that's safe for women, that's, uh, that's a fantastic place for them to want to be a part of. And then, of course, uh, in promoting them into interventional cardiology. But I would say that the women's groups, the women as one, all of the, we will fail if we don't have you powerful men who have the majority vote of all of the uh, committee's powerful way of saying who's going to get paid what, who's going to get what position, who's going to be recruited, and how you're going to make sure that they get not just the responsibility but authority in the cath lab for certain procedures or what have you. They, it will not happen if we don't have your backing as, as the men at the helm because you're there now, but soon, hopefully, it'll be all of us together as one. And that's why we started this as women as one. But what we believe is that we should all be together as one to actually make this problem go away because it's a very, very big problem. So um, Dr. Kinney, what are you gonna do to make sure, what do you think needs to be done? And what are you gonna do better? You do a lot of good things, but what are you gonna do better uh, not only just making sure that uh, we have more women training, um, also what's important is even after training, I think uh, what they do once they go to their uh, practice, whether it is they're going for academic practice or they're going for a private practice, as young women, um, they do have, uh, you know, issues as they start practicing. So I have my own little group of, uh, uh, you know, women that I've trained. So always they keep asking me for advice, um, how to handle this situation, that situation. So I'm available for them to grow. So it's the first, I would say, five to six years of their life. Um, so it is part of uh, the academic uh, growth and uh, personal growth also in the sense that, you know, many want to know how to plan their uh, family or if they have family issues how to deal with the family issues. Jamie, what are you going to do better or what do you think needs to be done for women in interventional cardiology? Well, um, locally speaking, we're, you know, we're working um, pretty hard to try and champion our, our staff and uh, faculty and, and trainees. And we have the SkyWin fellow for next year is one of our fellows and we're getting our, our faculty, female faculty on, you know, to the extent that we have any, um, ability to get uh, uh, to help folks get into into uh, speaking roles at all the conferences that um, you know many of which you help run and and others help run uh, we're, we're trying to get people you know onto the podium if that's in line with their career goals and that frankly is not in line with everybody's career goals but but certainly for many of our female trainees and faculty it is and so we've been working on that um, you know, our next stage issues that I'm kind of focused on are like, we don't, you know, space is a commodity. We don't have great, um, you know, we don't have like a great pumping station. And we have currently one of our interventional fellows who will be our advanced coronary fellow next year is, is pregnant due in a couple of months. And, and we have one of our incoming interventional fellows is currently pregnant due um, later in the year. And so, you know, there are things that we have not had to pay a lot of attention to or just haven't paid attention to for one reason, you know, for, for historical reasons. And we've got to, we've got to get working on that to make it. Um, I want to make sure everyone understands that the pumping stations are for breast milk, not yeah. for an intrauteric balloon pump. That's why I want to make sure they, they understand that. And I think, you know, the most of the guys who might be listening to this may not get it, but you're a hundred percent correct. We need to be more friendly towards women who want to have families. We need to be, we need to con never ever allow zero tolerance for anything that has to do a, as a sexist or a harassment or anything that has to do with them not feeling good. Uh, Srila, one word, what are you gonna do better? Because we gotta finish, one more minute. What do we uh, got? Can I make what it two words? Mentoring and advocacy. 
mentoring and advocacy. Sarah, one, two words. What are you going to do? We're, we're starting a peer mentorship pilot to help uh, promote women within the division and interventional specifically. Great. Elizabeth? Yeah, I think the same. Mentorship is important. We don't have any junior faculty, so we need to mentor that women go into interventional cardiology fellowship. David Lee. Wonderful. David? Uh, I think I'm going to focus on opportunity uh, and promotion. Opportunity and promotion. I love that. Promotion. That's what women need to be promoted. Uh, and Daniel? Well, uh, support, a lot of support for women. And I would take one concept of David uh, to make a more friendly uh, environment for them. Friendly environment, equitable environment, equality. And you all agree to be climb labs, right? You want to be climb labs. So you all have women in your lab, in your cath labs, and we want you to promote them. And so we'll be back to you about our climb program. Thank you so much, so much for taking time during this difficult uh, COVID period where I know everyone is absolutely clamoring and working hard around the clock to build our practices again, to control the virus, to learn, to educate, and perform good procedures and continue to contribute to the best possible care for our patients with cardiovascular disease. You guys are great. More women to you. More women to come to you. More power to you. That's women. So thank you. Thank you. Women as one is most appreciative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look a nice Brady Bunch. We're like the Brady Bunch. There is like the Brady Bunch. We can do a TikTok video or something like that. Thank you. We're all together as one. Thank you. Bye-bye.